Okay. It looks like people are still making their way in, but I think we've got a sizable audience already, so I'm going to begin. Let me start by introducing myself. My name is Aviva Dorch, and I'm the director of Jewish Renaissance magazine. I'm really delighted to be working on tonight and a forthcoming course I will tell you about at the end called Spies, Lies and Secret Missions um, with the Lions Learning Project. This is the beginning of what we hope will be a long-term and successful partnership um, about to do some series of about Jewish culture and Jewish history um, with the best kind of online learning events. And I'm really delighted that we're launching that partnership with tonight's talk because we've got a fascinating subject and also a fascinating person talking about her. I'll come on to our subject in a moment, Ethel Rosenberg, but I just wanted to start off by saying a big welcome to Anne Sabba. Anne is a biographer, a lecturer, a journalist, a former Reuters foreign correspondent, and she's also the author of many, many books. She specialised particularly in the lives of women. Her subjects include Mother Teresa, Laura Ashley, probably most famously Wallace Simpson, and now Ethel Rosenberg, who we're going to be exploring this evening. She's also a former chair of Britain's Society of Authors, um, of which I for one is, and I'm sure all the writers throughout the UK are very grateful to her for her work on that. She's a former president of Arts Richmond and a trustee of the National Archives and a senior research fellow at the Institute of Historical Research. So Anne, who we have to talk to us, is a historian, a journalist, and someone who specialises in women. And tonight's subject is a really interesting woman, and particularly an interesting Jewish woman. And we're hopefully going to look at both those dimensions. I particularly became interested in the story of Ethel Rosenberg, who, as I'm hoping you all know, and the reason you're here tonight, was executed for treason in 1953. Um, but I became familiar with the story that Anne is going to look at in more depth through the various cultural descriptions. Um, we read about her at the beginning of Sylvia Plath's The Bell Jar, the poet Adrienne Rich um, writes a poem all about her life and her death. The um, fabulous um, theatre production and HBO miniseries Angels in America brings her alive on stage during Tony Kushner's exploration of the 1980s America and the HIV crisis, even though she died 30 years before that setting. She's a really key cultural figure. I'd say she's something of a cultural phenomenon. Um, and it's rare for that to be a Jewish woman, even rarer for a Jewish woman who is considered a traitor. We're going to unpack some of that tonight. We'll unpack that notion of the cultural icon. I hope we'll begin to unpack as well that female identity. That's really what Anne's book is so good at, is bringing her alive as a human being, as a mother, um, as a very, very talented singer and actress, um, and as a wife and a sister as well as looking at the political dimension. And we'll also set it very much in context of 1950s America and what is happening Jewishly there and around the world. So welcome, Anne, and please do join me on screen. Thank you. Thank you for asking me to do this tonight. Oh, well, we're thrilled to have you. And let me start by asking, what was it that drew you to the narrative of Ethel Rosenberg? Well, I thought you might start by asking me that. It is one of the most difficult questions that authors have to respond to when you've spent about five years working on a book, which is um, about my average, because you become so familiar with the story that you think, well, I always knew that. How on earth did I actually start? 
And one way to get around that is to keep a diary so that you remember when you learned something. But actually, there are two moments I'm going to talk about. One of them is when I was a very young mother in New York in the 1970s, I had um, a baby son and, and a daughter. And because I'd actually just been um, asked to leave by Reuters, I had time on my hands to discover um, I'd been asked to leave because I was pregnant. You could do that in those days. So I had time on my hands to discover American literature. And I remember one book in particular, the E.L. Doctor, the book of Daniel, which had come out a couple of years beforehand, which is a highly fictionalized version of the Rosenberg story. So that was the first I knew about it. We were living in Brooklyn. We often walked to the Lower East Side. Um, and my husband and I often said to each other, well, what if our parents had ended up here um, and not in, not in England? But I couldn't possibly have written about that story then. I was far too immature. I had a lot of growing up to do. Um, but, but the seed was planted, and I never forgot the impression that, that the book made. And then my most recent book was about women in water in Paris called Les Parisiennes. And the publishers were polite enough to me after that to say, well, you've written about lots of women spies in that book. Suppose you draw out the story of one spy. And I should say that I think for publishers, <coughs> there's something about women spies that they consider sexy in publishing terms. It's women telling lies. It's women being furtive. It's women not obeying the norms that are expected of them. Anyway, there wasn't a woman in that book that I particularly wanted to write about, but that's when I remembered the story of Ethel Greenglass, as she was, Ethel and her brother, the woman accused of being a spy, the woman killed for being a spy, who I had always thought simply was not. But I didn't really know many of the details. So I started to look into what was available on the internet and to read around it. And one of the things that absolutely shocked me was the extraordinary misogyny that I found surrounding the case where, I mean, I could cite so many examples of it, but Ethel was accused by the judge of a crime worse than murder. What can be worse than murder? Well, in his views, it was because Ethel somehow came to represent everything about America. She was demonized. She, she represented um, the, the uh, appalling things that would happen if the American way of life was overturned. So don't forget, this is shortly after World War II, the height of the Cold War and McCarthyism, and the danger that the Republicans felt um, if the Democrats were going to take over. Maybe they'd won the war. Well, of course, they had won World War II, but they were in danger of losing the peace. So there was a real existential threat of Soviet communism overtaking America and, and real fear. And in order to punish Ethel and Julius, they needed to be strong in the face of this credible communist threat. So um, there were many other instances of misogyny and how Ethel simply did not conform to the image of American motherhood that was expected of her. And I really hope we'll come back to some of them. But I'm just going to read one um, extract from my book, not my words, but the words of a journalist. Because um, during the trial, the jury was not sequestered. So in other words, the jury could read everything that the press was saying, and the press were very open in describing red commie spies. And here's something um, that I think will help show you why I, I was so appalled. Um, finally, on the afternoon of Monday, the 26th of March, it was Ethel's turn to take the witness stand. She seemed to have paid more attention than usual to her appearance. For today, she was wearing some carefully applied lipstick to go with her plain pink blouse and black skirt. 
Although she appeared calm as she sat in the high back chair in a booth to the left of the judge, she must have been nervous as she took the oath and prepared to answer Alexander Block's questions. She'd spent the past two weeks sitting silently in court, looking away as she endured her brother's accusations. This was her chance. Inez Robb, a former war correspondent turned syndicated columnist, wrote an astute account of Ethel's appearance, which also gave her millions of readers the frisson of uncovering the real woman beneath her bland exterior. Ethel resembled any woman you might meet in the supermarket, Rob wrote. There are 50,000 Ethel Rosenbergs on the subway any workday morning. This 34-year-old woman sits at the defendant's table in court wearing the tired uniform of the clerk or stenographer, a dark wool skirt, a whitewash blouse and a white wool sweater. Hers is a dish face complexion, pasty and features undistinguished. It is difficult to imagine this ordinary looking woman, slightly dumpy, mixed up in anything as dashing as espionage, for she looks about as dashing as bread pudding. She does not even make the best of her naturally curly dark hair. Her bob is neither long nor short and it needs shaping. All in all, she looks innocuous and vacuous until you come to her eyes. They are not only her best feature, but probably the clue to her being. They are large, dark and extremely intelligent. There is no way to camouflage them or the mentality that lies behind them. So just before I finish as to why I wanted to write this book, um, I wanted somehow to restore Ethel's humanity. I felt that Ethel had been wrapped up in the phrase, oh, the Rosenbergs, those spies, because Julius was a spy, albeit a, a low level military and industrial spy. But I felt that Ethel had had her humanity taken away from her. Not only had she had her voice, uh, violently taken from her. She hadn't been given a chance to speak, um, but she was always conveyed as a wicked woman. She was three years older than Julius. That was abnormal at the time, according to the judge who described her as the master, the senior partner in this enterprise. There was absolutely no attempt to understand who Ethel really was, other than that she was a bad mother and she did not suit the American dream of the all-American housewife of the 1950s who stayed home and simply looked after her children. She somehow was perceived as a threat and everything that was written about her and said about her was to reinforce this woman with the wicked evil eyes who clearly was out to destroy America and therefore she had to be killed. There's so much in there and what you're saying because the irony is from reading your book it seemed that actually motherhood was, was one of the most important things to her and she was doing everything she could almost not against her nature but she was sacrificing so much of herself to be the best mother that she could so I'm going to ask you in a moment about motherhood because that image of her as the bad mother seems very very far from the truth but actually, the thing that surprised me most reading your book was, in some ways, I felt like it was a treatise about motherhood, both Ethel as mother, but also how much of what happened with Ethel and her brother was also re a reaction to Ethel and David's own mother. So there was the kind of Ethel as a daughter um, being mothered in a way that led her towards her fate, as well as Ethel as a mother fighting very hard for her sons. 
So I'm going to ask you about that. But just the other thing as well to ask you about is the image side. You just talked about, you gave us this perfect description of her in court, quite shabbily dressed, actually, or not conscious of the image, despite those bright eyes. And yet, one of the things that you pick up in the book is, first of all, that her clothing at times is because she's been lent pieces of clothing by other women in the prison, and she's trying to kind of please them. But also, this is a woman who started off being a singer and an actress, who is very aware of image and performance. So that lack of awareness kind of combined seems quite strange. So let me... Well, know. let's let's talk mm -hmm. about the easy, the easy aspect first, her clothes. She didn't have any money. Not only did she not have any money, but she didn't think that, that how you dressed was important. But they really were impoverished. Um, although I've already told you that Julius was a spy, he didn't spy for money. So um, they, they had very little spare cash. But it just was not the focus of, of her life. And when she was in prison, you know, that extract I read you, she was criticized for not having a decent haircut. I mean, how ridiculous what she meant to do, having been in, in prison for, for the last nine months. But um, what did seem to matter more to her was when the other inmates of the women's prison made crocheted hats or gave her bits of, of their own clothing to wear. She thought it was more important to please them than to please the public. So, yes, she, she didn't realize the importance of how she appeared. And she made lots of missteps during her trial as well. Um, so so I, I think her acting was not about how she looked. It was more about singing, actually, and being musical. But, but she was creative. So I don't think motherhood came easily or naturally to Ethel. But I often say, if this is about one thing, my book is about X. And then I find, actually, my book is about more than one thing. <laughs> but here we go. Um, one of the things that my book is about is about families and how destructive families can be. And there are two families in this book that matter. There's the Greenglass family, which is Ethel's birth family. And she was the only daughter with three sons, but Ethel's mother, who never spoke English and, and remained a Yiddish speaker and almost illiterate, so Ethel um, translated for her. Um, and Ethel's mother did not cherish girls, but she certainly didn't cherish learning for girls. Ethel was the bright child in, in this family of four. Ethel skipped a year at school. Ethel discovered through this wonderful public school singing and acting, but her mother never came to um, her performances. She learned to sing. And for Ethel, it wasn't good enough just to sing in any choir. She wanted to sing at Carnegie Hall. So she taught herself. So you see a really driven young woman, but she was driven by some inner force and not by her parents, not by parental approbation. As far as her mother was concerned, women should just, Jewish women should just get married, find a suitable partner. And all the love and ambition was poured into the sons, but particularly David, the younger son, who was apparently when he was born, had curly hair and chubby cheeks and everyone adored him, including Ethel. He was not bright. He flunked most of his exams. So as soon as Ethel could, she had to leave school. She couldn't go to college. And she got a job working for a packing company. And much of her wages were given back to the mother. So Ethel grew up in this family where she was not cherished, where she, uh, she was not given any ambition. Um, and she nonetheless learned to master her own emotions and to become very single-minded in what she did. When she met Julius Rosenberg, and they were married in 1939, he was probably the first man who really valued her, who showed her approbation for what she did, and particularly her singing. And um, I think she was very single-minded, as I've said, and, and when she had to give up singing because it wasn't producing enough money and she couldn't go on tour, and they had their first child in 1943. 
she believed that she could be the most perfect mother and a better mother than her mother had been to her. Um, and so she poured everything into the discoverability of being a good mother. It was just at a time when, when there were books about mothering, but Ethel not only read the books, not only had a subscription to Parenting Magazine, she went to mothering classes um, being given by Edith Buxbaum, a, a Viennese refugee. And she went to music classes, learning the guitar, thinking she could teach her son. He was actually a very difficult child by his own admission. He didn't sleep well. He, he wasn't particularly healthy. And, and then she had a second son who was much easier. But I had the good fortune to meet the child psychotherapist who was actually helping Ethel with being a good mother. I flew to California and met her. She was in her late 90s and she's still alive at 100. And the most wonderful woman who told me how she believed Ethel was nearly there. Ethel just had no boundaries. She was trying to be a modern mother. She wanted her children to call her Ethel and things were getting out of hand. But she said Ethel was so determined to learn. And I saw aspects of her being a good mother while she was in prison. It seemed to me the main focus of Ethel's mothering in prison, and how could she be a mother from afar, was trying to prepare her sons for a possible life without her afterwards. I think she was always thinking, how can I somehow enable my sons to be everything I had hoped for them. But to say that she was a bad mother is so contradicted by the evidence. And just to finish, when I say this book is about two families, um, and I, I sometimes call the first family because it was David, her younger brother, who ultimately betrayed her. The only evidence that um, killed her was David's perjury, and we'll talk about that, I'm sure, in more detail. Um, so you can call it a Greek tragedy, a Shakespearean tragedy, whatever it is, she was ultimately sent to her death by her brother. But there is redemption, because when both Ethel and Julius are killed, her two sons are ten and, and six, and although various people come forward and try to adopt them, um, there are attempts to institutionalize them by New York State that's worried um, that these two boys will cause problems trying to vindicate their parents. But out of the blue steps this amazing couple, Anne and Abel Mirapol. Um, he's a songwriter who wrote the lyrics for Strange Fruit and it's off those uh, the royalties from the lyrics that they live. And Abel and Anne, who tried to have children themselves, but they lost three children and stillbirths, pour a huge amount of love and a huge amount of discipline into these two boys who take the name Mirapol and who um, are still alive and in their 70s. So again, one of the reasons I wanted to write this book now was in order to catch people who are still alive, 70 is just about pushing it to the limit, but um, both these boys, as I call them, retired um, university professors, now men in their 70s, were alive. And it absolutely was not an authorized book, but they do have memories of, of their mother. And so, um, yeah, I've, I've got to know them since the book has been published. Fantastic. And even I believe the next generation are now involved because Ethel's granddaughter made a film about her. Is that right? Based on her father's campaigning to try and clear Ethel's name. Yes, um, certainly Ivy Mirapol has made a very moving film. But most recently, she's made a film about um, Roy Cohn. So perhaps we'll jump to the trial at this point because... Um, Roy Cohn, who was only 23 when he was assistant prosecutor, um, nonetheless wanted to prove himself as a good Jew, as an establishment Jew, as one of those Jews who was not going to put up with these terrible, traitorous um, commie Jews on the Lower East Side. And he did that by persuading Ethel's brother, David, um, who had been at Los Alamos, which is where the um, Manhattan Project to build the bomb was based. 
and um, he persuaded David to lie to say that he had seen Ethel type some notes, which was part of a plea bargain. And when he came out of prison, he admitted that um, he hadn't actually seen Ethel and he couldn't really remember who'd done any typing, if indeed anyone had, and perhaps it was his own wife. So his own wife, Ruth, and he had been involved in spying, in passing information to the Soviets, but he served about just less than 10 years and Ruth was never indicted. But the deal he did with Roy Cohn, who went on to become McCarthy's right-hand man and ultimately went on to work for Trump. Um, and some of you may have heard in Trump's last years when things weren't going quite so well, he was heard to say, where is my Roy Cohn? So that's the second film that Ivy Mirapol has made about how Roy Cohn um, was responsible for sending um, well, for persuading David to perjure himself, and that perjury is um, what sent Ethel to her death. Uh, this is very complicated, and I think I should just take a step back at this point and say that um, when Julius and Ethel were arrested in 1950, first Julius, and three weeks later, because he refused to name names, they arrested Ethel. They knew all along that the evidence against Ethel was shaky at best. Um, and Hoover uh, uh, decided uh, that th there was a, a decision to arrest Ethel in the hope that she would act as a lever. That was their word. But actually, she was a state hostage. They thought that surely any mother will talk, will name names. And in fact, as the Deputy Attorney General said at the end, she called our bluff because neither of them did name any names. And what Ethel and Julius were charged with was conspiracy to commit espionage. And that's very important because, of course, conspiracy is almost impossible to disprove. Effectively, it means that she and Julius were having conversations together. Well, of course they could. And I, I, I really repeat several times, um, Ethel must have known what her husband was doing. Not only known, she probably approved of it, but that's not a crime. It's not a crime in British or American law to think or to know. The crime is actually committing an overt act. And that was where the FBI had real difficulty in coming up with an overt act that they could lay at Ethel's feet. And so that's where Roy Cohn came in by persuading David to conjure up a story um, that he had seen his sister actually do the typing. That, that was the overt act. I mean, there were so many miscarriages of justice during the trial, apart from the fact that the judge, Irving Kaufman, um, consorted with the prosecution, even though he said that he had not taken advice about uh, applying a death sentence. The choice of, of the jury um, really needs investigating and, and discussion. But the perjury, as I've mentioned, the other real issue is that they were not charged with treason. They were not charged with treason partly because the alleged spying took place during the war when um, Russia and America were actually allies. So it couldn't count as treason. Uh, none, uh, and, and also because had they been charged with treason, the evidence required is different. You need two people to witness an overt act. Well, there hadn't been two people witnessing this. Um, nonetheless, the judge and the prosecution kept introducing the word treason during the trial. So effectively, there was an oral indictment of treason. And the jury really were led to believe, because the word was mentioned so many times, that they were trying Ethel and Julius as traitors. And in fact, they weren't. They were trying them for conspiracy to commit espionage. And can we just take a step back? Because this is fascinating. And I think 
that trial needs to be looked at in a little more depth. And you just brought up, well, the composition of the jury is an issue. So just to explain to our audience, the trial, if I'm right, it was the jury was drawn from Brooklyn. Is that right? Yet there wasn't a single Jew. It, 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 you're absolutely right. There was not a single Jew. And not to have a single Jew on the jury in New York was bizarre. There was also only one woman. They spent about three days um, uh, picking the prospective jurors. And it turns out that um, many Jews absented themselves because they did not want to be responsible for sending um, a fellow Jews to their death. So that could be, and probably was, why there were no Jews. But also, um, the prosecution who were allowed many objections to the prospective jurors were nervous that Jews wouldn't necessarily look more favorably on this couple. They may feel, as indeed the judge and, and the prosecutors, who were all Jewish, they may feel, we've got to show we're really patriotic. We're not putting up with spies. So um, the, the thing that I'm often asked is, were they arrested as a result of anti-Semitism? And I really do need to spend a little time talking about that because they were not arrested as a result of anti-Semitism. They were arrested as a result of a very specific chain of events. Um, th there were some cables that were deciphered which have subsequently been known as the Venona cables, which are the cables sent by Russian agents in New York back to Moscow. And in these agents, where all, uh, in these cables where all the KGB agents are given code names, there's a reference to Julius, although he's called by his code name, Antenna or Liberal. But um, there is no reference to Ethel other than as her own, as Ethel, who does not work. That is, she was not involved in spying. And she has no code name, and she was not dealing directly with the KGB. But the significance of these cables is that the men who had been deciphering them, um, Lamfair and Gardner, uh, used them to, to uncover Klaus Fuchs. Now, Klaus Fuchs, who was an East German who had been working on the Manhattan Project, a physicist who really did help the Russians and gave them important information, was arrested in Cambridge in 1950. And that's when the whole thing unraveled because Klaus Fuchs confessed and he was given the maximum sentence that you could give in England, which is 14 years, of which he served nine. And here you see a very interesting aspect of the whole story, because the British were really rather embarrassed, as the British always are with spies or with most things. You know, you can see how the British respond to the Cambridge Five. They sort of hush it up. They don't really want much fuss about it. So the Klaus Fuchs um, case was, was really dealt with very swiftly. He was given 14 years, of which he served nine. But Klaus Fuchs named names. He named his courier who was a man called Harry Gold. Um, and Harry Gold, who was already in prison and a serial liar, named a young couple who were quickly identified as David and Ruth Greenglass because he'd, he'd, he'd exchanged information and money with them. David Greenglass named, and this is important, just Julius. He did not name Ethel very clearly. He named Julius. So the American authorities assumed that if they arrested Julius, he would name names. They knew from these cables that he was aspiring recruiter. But the buck stopped there. Julius did not name any names. And that's why they arrested Ethel. But here you see this crucial difference between the Brits and the Americans. The Americans have these low level communist spies and they want to show to their own country it's a political issue. They want to show we're being really strong with these communists. We're going to have a big trial. We're going to give them the maximum sentence we can. We're going to show we do not put up with communist spies. And so that's a crucial difference between the way the Americans and, and the Brits dealt with, with this issue. And there is no doubt that... Um, 
the fact that the Russians had exploded a bomb, which was a real serious existential worry for Americans. And the Americans had not been able to imagine that the Russians were anywhere close to um, uh, detonating their own uh, bomb. And, and they had been given help by some Americans and also by Klaus Fuchs. But, but the other thing is that the Americans misread the situation because the Russians were really far further ahead than they were given credit for. Fantastic. So I'm going to pick you up on some of those things again, because you, you're raising so many things. Um, we've only got a short space of time. And obviously, if you want the full account, you're going to have to read the book. But there are there's quite a lot of detail there that I'd like to unpack a little bit. But just to say to our audience this evening, I will ask Anne one or two more questions, but then we'd love to open it up to you. So if you've got questions, please do either put a note in the chat or raise your virtual hand. And Emma from Lines Learning is going to be monitoring the chat and she'll also keep an eye out if um, raised hands go up. You can find your raised hand in the reactions button. So, and she'll bring you on screen. So please, if you've got questions for Anne, do ask them. But I'm going to pick up on, you're talking about the difference between America and England, and a lot of that is about attitudes to communism. Um, I wonder also how much of that is that it, we are so close in England to Europe and the spectre in 1953, the spectre of the concentration camps was massive. America, obviously, I don't know, further away or less so, but Arthur Miller said something really interesting that you quote about how close 53 is and this idea that after understanding what happens in the camps and the gas chambers of two more Jews being put to death, you know, how that affected him emotionally. And of course, Miller was also one of those people who experienced the McCarthy era, this kind of there's, there's this context of naming names. So the, the kind of moment in time in America, this is a very American story. It's a post-war story. It's a post-Holocaust story. It's also a story that leads into the Cold War and communism. Would you unpick for us a little bit about that and about the historical... Well, I'll try. I'll try. I mean, I find the anti-Semitism issue so complex because you have people like um, Morris Ernst, who was um, one of these self-made, very wealthy Jews who had the ear, as he thought, of Eleanor Roosevelt and the presidents. And he thought he could show himself as a really good establishment Jew who was a member of, of a club. And they didn't want to lose those privileges and that role within the establishment. So they really wanted to punish this sort of traitorous Jew as, as they saw it. I mean, to the point where it seemed as if communism was almost on trial because so many communists were Jews. So as I said, it wasn't anti-Semitism that led to their being picked up. I've, I've given the chain of events that led to it. And I don't think their trial led to an increase in anti-Semitism. So you're left with the question, well, where was anti-Semitism present? Well, it was certainly present in the courtroom, the courtroom which had a Jewish judge and a Jewish prosecutor. So um, they had willingly stepped up to the plate and it's almost like you know, Jews who were forced to be capos in, in the camps, who are forced to deal with fellow Jews. Um, but I think actually in this case, they had much more choice about what they did. I think anti-Semitism is just part of the toxic mix to, along with anti-communism and misogyny. It, it was a torrid time post-war when the Americans felt we've lost lots of our boys in Europe. We fought for a better way of life, for the American way of life, and now we're in danger of, of losing that because they painted Ethel as this transgressive, witch-like person who somehow threatened you know, there was heavy advertising of women to stay at home and buy fridges and cars and, 
and, and fulfill this American dream. And somehow Ethel was painted as a woman who refused to stay in her box like this. So it's, it's all part of it. And if we're moving on to Arthur Miller and the artistic interpretations of this story, why is it that all the artistic interpretations have focused on Ethel? Not Ethel and Julius, not Julius, but Ethel. And I think it's because there is a deep-seated shame in America that recognizes this woman probably was not in any way guilty. And even if she was guilty, as I believe, of supporting her husband, you could give her a custodial sentence. You don't need to kill the woman. So there is this deep-seated feeling, how on earth did this happen, that we killed a mother in America, that um, we allowed a, a, a mother against whom we knew the evidence was weak, that, that two children were orphaned. And so in order to try and understand this moment in American history, when they clearly gave in to hysteria and Eisenhower, for example, wrote to his son with ghastly symmetry, his son was serving in Korea. So, you know, you had the Korean War as well, which um, I haven't talked about, that, but that was another element. The Americans felt that all communism was part and parcel of the same threat. The Chinese had just become a communist nation and the Korean War, where they were fighting against North Korea, um, which was a communist nation. So Eisenhower writes to his son and says, of course, it goes against the grain to execute a mother, but we have to do it because A, she's the senior partner in this enterprise, no evidence for that. And B, because if we don't, the Russians will recruit all their spies from among women, as if women hadn't been spies already, had he not heard of, of Marta Hari. So, um, you know, there is this feeling that somehow the highest levels of America let themselves down. And um, Arthur Miller's play, The Crucible, uh, which has such clear parallels Although he says he did not write it in response to the Rosenberg story, the audience clearly thought differently and, and stood up in, in silence on the night of their um, electrocution. And Arthur Miller himself said, you know, you can't say that there was no anti-Semitism because here we are burning Jews only seven or eight years after the Holocaust, where six million Jews were killed or, or burnt. So, as I say, it's difficult to pin down, but it's impossible to say that it wasn't there. Absolutely. Um, you keep mentioning the, the motherhood. And when I finish off, before we pass over to the audience, I'd love to ask you to do one more thing, because this is how you portray Ethel in the book, for example. You know, we see her with her child. We see her as the family woman. It's that. It's such a different image, isn't it? And well, one of the I, things I felt very strongly about the photographs because when they were arrested, the FBI took everything: all their letters, all their possessions, meagre as they were, and all their photographs. So her two sons grew up without any images of their parents um, holding them, touching them, being parents. And I've spent a lot of time trying to think what that must do to you as a child. And the images that I've shown in the book are pictures that strangers or family have got hold of and sent to the sons subsequently, so they didn't grow up with them. And I think that picture that you showed um, is, is really evocative of Ethel trying to be the best mother she possibly could. If you read the prison letters, which were the other aspect of my book that I feel very privileged to have spent time reading, she was clearly trying to do the best she could to prepare her sons for a life without parents. Um, can I just read one of her final 
Yes, those that's are the exactly letters. what I was going to ask you to finish off. Would you read maybe one of the letters she wrote on the day she died, possibly, or one of the final letters? Yes, the, these letters are all in Boston University, and they're full of, you know, crossings out. They're on this flimsy brown prison paper written in pencil. But here's one of the last. Um, My dearest darlings, this is the process known as sweating it out, and it's tough, that's for sure. At the same time, we can't let a lot of chickens that go about their business without panic, even when something's frightening them. We can't let them put us to shame, can we? Maybe you thought that I didn't feel like crying too <clears throat> when we were hugging and kissing goodbye, huh? Even though I'm slightly older than 10. Darlings, that would have been so easy, far too easy on myself. And I had to resist a very real temptation to follow your lead and break down with you. Because I love you more than myself. And because I knew you needed that love far more than I needed the relief of crying. Amazing, amazing. Thank you so much for sharing those with us. Um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to pass over to Emma Brand from Lions Learning, and she's going to bring in some of the audience questions to take forward. Um, gosh, I'm, I'm very emotional. What a place to, to leave it and what a woman she was. Over to Emma. Yeah, so I just want to start by saying thank you, um, it was really, really interesting. And it's it's a period of history where I kind of only know the headline. So it's very, it's it's amazing to, to hear a bit more um, of the background and context. Um, so I have one question um, that has come in from Anna Gordon. So I'm just gonna ask you, Anna, if you could turn on your camera and then I can spotlight you um, so you can ask your question yourself. Uh, Anna Gordon. There we go. Oh, okay. You'd like me to read it, sorry. <laughs> Unless you would like to. So Anna, Anna's asked, um, uh, do we have any information on the defence lawyer? Did he do a good job? Sorry, can you say that again? Something about do we? Do you have any information about the Rosenberg's defence lawyer? Um, I think they do a good job. Yes, um, so he was called Emmanuel Block, um, and he was quite clearly way out of his depth. Um, there are lots of things to say about the defence, which obviously, since it failed, was inadequate. On the other hand, nobody else would take the case. So um, I, I think Manny Block is a bit of a hero. He absolutely did everything. He ran himself ragged. And um, age 51, he had a heart attack a year after it was all over. Um, but, you know, he did presumably give Ethel the wrong advice in telling her to take the Fifth Amendment. Um, I'm sure you're all familiar with that. They felt that <clears throat> it was communism on trial and they did not want Ethel to be judged by being a communist. So every time she thought it was an incriminating question, she refused to answer on the grounds that it might tend to incriminate her. There was a precise form of words, but they tied her up in knots because if she'd said one thing in the grand jury, why was she now um, giving a fuller answer? And she would have been better advised clearly to answer the questions and to admit, yes, I'm a communist, but just because I'm a communist, I, I'm not necessarily a spy. And because the case has been rerun by um, various um, bar associations in America a couple of times since, and every time they advise her um, not to take the Fifth Amendment and she's found innocent, um, you know, clearly he, he was wrong, but you know, that is with hindsight. And at the time, the problem was that they weren't given grand jury information. So the grand jury information is where um, in America, you have to go before 
um, a, a, a jury without the benefit of legal advice, and that's where they decide if there's a case to answer. Well, the law has changed now, and in the real trial, the prosecution lawyers are shown the grand jury information, but Manny Block was not shown that at the time. He didn't have to be. So he didn't know, for example, that when David was originally arrested, he said, oh, leave my sister out of it. You know, my sister's got nothing to do with this. This is not about Ethel. She wasn't involved. Well, Manny Block didn't know that. Um, it's only in 2015 that I've seen David's grand jury testimony. So, you know, it's very easy to blame Manny Block, who actually was working with his father, Alexander Block, but they were, they were not experienced in this sort of trial and um, they weren't somehow able to extrapolate Ethel from Julius and Ethel was deemed by the jury to be shifty. She wasn't told to smile, to show emotion. If she'd broken down and cried, it would have helped. But, you know, all, all of those things we can see subsequently, but it, it was not possible at the time to see that. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to bring up Elaine Aloof, whose hand is up. Um, oh, you can uh, unmute and ask your question. Sorry, a, a message came up, but I couldn't unmute it, that only you could. Um, can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Oh, okay. Um, first of all, um, I really, if you could call it enjoyed, really enjoyed the book very much. Um, unlike the young lady that, uh, I think it was you. <laughs> um, I've always known about this case because my parents were members of the Communist Party and I heard about this as a child and what my parents thought about the trial and what happened to these people. Um, actually, there were two things I wanted to ask you. It just seemed to me that it was almost corrupt the way that the, the case was run. The judge and the prosecution, I, I couldn't understand that in a so-called democratic country with a, a legal system, that they could have got away with that. The judge was just so biased against her. And the other thing I wanted to uh, ask you was, how did the Mirapoles come to adopt the boys? Because I know that you that the um, her mother wasn't interested at all, and his fam his mother was ill, I think. Um, how was that allowed? You said they just sort of kind of appeared. Um, yeah. Okay, so the trial, well, I don't actually use the word corrupt, but I could, and I agree with you. It it, it clearly was corrupt, and I think, um, you know, when I say if my book is about only one thing, it is about the importance of the rule of law. That really is the most basic thing that I think it behoves us all to remember. And and clearly, um, the, the rule of law was um, found wanting in, in this um, trial. And, and the judge is horrific in his bias and, and treatment of, um, of the case. But you know, as Eleanor Roosevelt said, this has been tried at various uh, other levels. Well, it hadn't been. I mean, uh, the, the Supreme Court uh, declined it. So, so the judiciary um, behaved very badly. That's why in my final chapter, I talk about all the people who let Ethel down and it wasn't just her family, it was the media and, and the judiciary and, and many other um, things in between. So um, I, I agree with, with what you've said there. How did the Mirapoles come into the picture? Well, um, Manny Block actually and his fiance wanted to adopt them. And there were lots of people from Israel and France who also wanted to take them. But um, New York State was trying to keep them in an institution because it was very nervous that if these two boys 
went and lived with another family, they'd only cause problems. They'd be a thorn in the side of, of um, um, American justice for the rest of their lives. In fact, um, the Meripols were introduced to them by W.E. Du Bois, who was a well-known human rights black campaigner. And they just somehow had the right mix of discipline and love. And they were um, taught to respect their parents, but not to keep going back to their parents' story. And, you know, it just was one of those miracles that actually seems to to have worked and they still call themselves Mirapol, but they um, admit to being the children of of the Rosenberg so they've somehow managed to to do that extraordinary balancing act um so I have uh one last question for you um which is uh you talked earlier about um the difference in how communism and the threat of communism was perceived in America and in the UK. Um, and I was just wondering whether the reaction to the trial was different in the aftermath. Um, obviously America was like very gripped by it. It was very um, local and urgent, but in the rest of the world, um, how was it perceived? And particularly the UK. Um the UK really did not get itself very involved in this. I found um, very little uh, about it in, in England. But in France, where there's a big Communist Party, there were huge protests and the clemency movement got, got underway. And so, you know, you actually have um, Jean-Paul Sartre, the Pope and Einstein all uniting in condemnation of, of killing a woman. So Europe, where there's always been a stronger Communist Party than there has in England, seems to have um, been more active in um, trying to fight for clemency, at, at least for, for Ethel. Thank you very much. Um, so with that, um, I'm going to close off the questions um, and hand back over to Aviva. So thank you very much um, for everything tonight, Anne. Uh, it's been a really fascinating evening. Um, I'm just going to add Aviva back in. Thank you. Um, it's fascinating, Anne. And I, I'm just wondering, because looking at Les Parisiennes, at Wallace Simpson, at Mother Teresa, you know, what have you taken from each of these women? And what do you think is the thing that you will take from Ethel going forward into your work? And I, I mean, I don't know if you'll let us know a little bit about, just to finish off what your next project might be, but if not, what Ethel has done for you and made you, has it changed you or changed your practice at all, researching this book? Gosh, well, I haven't got another project. I think Ethel has really eaten into my psyche. Um, and I, I think I do get very um, emotionally involved over five years. How could you not? Um, I've been interested in prisons for a long time. I saw Ethel's prison and I'm not comparing lockdown with um, Ethel's time. But nonetheless, I have tried to think of what her life would be like in isolation. And it's difficult just to shake that off and move on to somebody else. Um, I mean, she's not always easy to like. She wasn't a saint. Of course, she was flawed. But I feel that so many women have had um, have been reduced to a one-dimensional static person and Ethel particularly had her humanity brutally violently removed from her. Uh, you can see that when the electrocution was announced and um, there was a, a reporter called Bob Considine who announced it to the world who had to watch it and he was so shaken by what he'd seen he could barely get his words out but he uttered the um, appalling words. Ethel was electrocuted after Julius. The FBI chose that 
deliberately because they thought um, she was ne she was the stronger of the pair and she was never going to give way. Whereas if they electrocuted her first and then Julius, perhaps Julius would confess and then wouldn't the optics of that be terrible to have killed a mother and have the father still alive? So they, they argued as to who to kill first. And so they killed Julius first with the standard three jolts of electricity. And then they brought Ethel into the electrocution chamber and strapped her up. And after three jolts, they unstrapped her. And to their horror, they found that her heart was still beating. So they had to strap her up again, put her in the chair, give her another two jolts, and finally they killed her. So when Bob Considine announced what had happened, um, albeit with a shaking voice, he said he described this procedure and he said that three volts would have been enough to kill an ordinary person. And those words are what really have stuck in my craw because somehow Ethel has been billed as, as this wicked, transgressive person who was not an ordinary human being. And so I, I have felt that someone needed to restore her humanity, somehow needed to restore her voice. And if that's all I've done, and you can make up your own minds about her, but she was an ordinary human being who I believe really cared about loyalty and about her sons. And so anyway, I'm not ready to move on quite yet. <laughs> well, just to say to everyone here, I mean, she may be an ordinary woman, but it's an extraordinary story. And um, I just can't recommend the book enough. I found it just fascinating, but also just very humane. You know, as you say, you were interested in talking about the rule of law, but also it really, for me, brought out that intricate web of family. And um, even the fact that in Sing Sing, there she was, the Jewish woman, going to every faith service that she could, just to get some human companionship and a chance to sing. You know, that's not what we imagine from the outside of the woman in prison, but you gave her back herself and you've given her to us as a fully rounded human being so I'm really grateful and huge recommendation for the book to give an official vote of thanks though we're just going to bring on Ian Lancaster who is the chair of Jewish Renaissance um Ian over to you hold on there we go thank you Aviva but more especially, thank you, Anne. You have obviously got totally involved with this woman and her tragic story. That has come through this evening. You have given us your rawness, her tragedy, your commitment to giving us the truth and that's made for an amazing hour or so thank you for that but i also want to thank you for one other point uh, a, a side point perhaps but um arthur miller is a favorite playwright of mine um his play about the witches of salem i know very well I know that it refers to the McCarthy era. I didn't know that it also supposedly touches on the Ethel situation. So thank you for that little sidelight and illumination on one of my favorite plays. I can't not say something about this being the first collaboration between um, or the first manifestation of the collaboration between Jewish Renaissance and lifelong uh, and Lyons lifelong learning. As chairman of JR, this is a really exciting opportunity for us. 
I hope it is also an exciting opportunity for Lions Learning. Anne, you have set a very high bar for our coming program. I hope we meet that bar. I hope that everyone who is participating this evening will join in more of this LLP JR collaboration. On that point, thank you again, Anne. It's been a fascinating and engaging hour. And I'm gonna hand back to Aviva to just give a final wrap up. Yeah, thank you. So just on the note of the Lions Learning Project um, and Jewish Renaissance collaboration, we'll be emailing you more details but, and there's information on our website, but we're going to be running a, an eight week course called Spies, Lies and Secret Missions, the unsung Jewish heroes of World War II. Um, our first four, it's going to be eight weeks, our first four are going to focus on books, our second four on films. So just to give you a quick overview, we've got Peter Pomerantsev, I love his book, it's a nice play on the kind of Penguins and Famous Fives, but his, this is not propaganda, and he's looking at disinformation, very much picking up those kinds of themes that Anne was talking about, about why where power lies and how one uses language to convince people of something that might not necessarily be true. Um, from then on, we're going to Leah Garrett's ex troop and the secret Jewish commandos. We've got Helen Fry talking about the secret listeners. This was the beginning of um, the GCHQ, but it was Jewish, German Jewish refugees listening in to prisoner of war conversations. Um, and our last book is Charmian Brinson's Working for the War Effort, looking at how some Jewish refugees were classed as enemy aliens and others were taken to become secret weapons. So as Anne has been exploring that fault line of the good Jew and the bad Jew that the prosecutors and Roy Conn was playing on, this is very much looking at what happened to Jewish, German Jewish, German speaking Jewish refugees in propaganda. We then go on to four weeks on film. Um, I don't know if you all know, but Operation Mincemeat as a film is about to come out um, about the life and activities of Ewan Montague. There's currently a musical about his life um, on at the moment at Southwark Playhouse. And we've got members of the Montague family. Actually, Ewan's granddaughter is going to talk to us about that and about what it's like to have Colin Firth play your grandfather. Um, we're looking at the story of Wilfred Israel, who owned one of the large department stores in Berlin, went back into Germany as a spy and rescued many Jews for Israel and took them to Israel, to, well then Palestine. We've got Elizabeth Friedlander's life story on film. She is who the Elizabeth type was named after. Um, she was an accomplished typographer who was in charge of design at the Ministry of Information's Black Propaganda Unit. And we're finishing off with story of the Portuguese Schindler, um, someone you may not have heard of, but who actually rescued thousands, Aristides de Sousa Mendes. Um, so I hope you'll join us for some or all of those sessions. And I hope Anne's talk has begun to pick up all sorts of themes and issues that will develop down the line. But I just want to finish by saying again, a massive thank you to her. Um, as you can see her, speaking is compelling, her writing is equally compelling and we're very grateful to her for writing for the magazine, for talking to us tonight and would love to say a huge thank you.